Hi ladies, this is Melanie Brown from Virtue, and I just want to tell you that I miss seeing your lovely faces, but I'm so encouraged that you've decided to continue on through the study of Philippians. And today I just want to share a few thoughts from Philippians chapter three. And I mean, I was just thinking about what would we do without the word of God? Because the word of God is our correction, it's our instruction, it's our motivation, it's our hope. And it's amazing to me that Paul penned this letter thousands of years ago, and it is so relevant to our lives today. And that's been my prayer, that we would um, see how to apply his word today in the year 2020. And I think what I'd like for you to do is insert your name into this letter and just receive it as though Paul was writing it to you personally, because that's what I did. And I want to hear this instruction from the Apostle Paul. And so I just took verse one and Paul's telling us and he's telling me, Melanie, rejoice in the Lord. And so I would be telling you, whoever's listening, Lindsay, Kathy, uh, Lisa, Pam, whoever's listening, today is the day that the Lord is asking you to rejoice in him. And you might read that statement and say, well, Paul, how can you tell me to rejoice? Because you don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know my circumstances. You don't know the sorrow that's in my heart, the things that are weighing heavy on my heart and or in my mind. And Paul would tell you very calmly, very confidently that the joy that he's speaking about, the joy that comes from the Lord is not based on our circumstances. The joy that he's talking about comes from the Lord. So the world doesn't give it and the world can't take it away. It's a joy that comes from knowing Jesus and trusting Jesus. And so he starts off by telling us to rejoice, to rejoice in the Lord. And then Paul tells us that he's going to repeat himself and he's not apologetic about it. He says in verse one that I'm going to tell you something that I've already told you. And I can just picture him. I can hear him saying, Melanie, I'm going to tell you something that you've already heard. And I would tell Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul, tell me again, because <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, because <laughs> I need to hear it again. I'm the type of person that needs to hear truth um, repeated. And really, I've heard that repetition is the key to learning. And so Paul is going to say something, but this is the caution that I want all of us to be aware of. Sometimes as believers, we can read the word, we can um, hear the word, and sometimes we can even memorize, you know, certain verses and we can say, oh, well, I know that. But what Paul would say is, but are you applying it? He's not just wanting us to know it here, but he wants us to know it here experientially to, for us to be living it out. And so he's repeating himself. And do you know what Paul loves to repeat over and over again through all his books, through all his letters, he repeats the good news of the gospel. It was the gospel that changed him and saved him. And it was the grace of, of, of knowing what Jesus did for him that, um, that he, he kept telling people he couldn't get enough. He couldn't tell people enough. And I think it would benefit us. And I think we would be disciplined if we would know how to share the gospel in like one minute or less. And I'm going to try to do it right now. And this is, these are just some elements of what the gospel is. The gospel is starting with the knowledge that God loves us, but sin separates us from God. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came and he lived a sinless, perfect life. And he died on the cross for my sin and for your sin. He paid the penalty that our sin deserved, but we didn't have to be punished because he is our substitute. And he absorbed the wrath of God. And so now there's this heavenly exchange where um, the Lord says, you give to me your, your sin and your shame and I will give to you in exchange my forgiveness and my righteousness. And that word righteousness mean, means to be right with God. And that's how we're made right with God, by putting our faith in Jesus. And then he rose from the dead, proving that he really is God and he said what he meant. And he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that now we can walk in this newness of life and we can walk um, getting to know Jesus better and better. 
And so that was what Paul says over and over again in every single letter that he wrote. And then he goes on to remind us that we are to rely on Jesus Christ alone. And he tells us to beware, to be careful, to be watchful for anyone or anything that would add to the simplicity and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Um, so he was very um, nervous for the, the church that they would fall under the prey of false teaching that would say, okay, yes, it's Jesus plus uh, you need to still follow the law or you still need to, um, uh, uh, there's still regulations that you need to keep. There's still uh, rituals that you need to perform. And Paul would say, it's Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Don't add anything to it. Don't let the outside forces infiltrate. And he'd also say, don't let inside influences um, sway you. Don't look inwardly. And that's what he means when he says, don't, don't, um, don't have any confidence in the flesh. He's saying, don't think that you have to be good enough or that you could be good enough to merit this righteousness, to earn your salvation or to get to heaven on your own. And he said, and he then uses itself as an example. He says, if anyone would be able to do that, it would be me. And he says, I'm the one who grew up in a godly home. I went to synagogue every week. I kept the law. I was obedient. I was, um, I was zealous. And he says, and all these things that I thought were to my account, he says, now I consider them like rubbish. I consider them uh, garbage, worthless, and futile compared to the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ personally. And, you know, I was thinking about how it's funny how we can think something so great until we have something better to compare it to. And I'm going to just warn you now, this is a really silly um, illustration. But when I was reading this, I was thinking about how when I first got my phone, it came with these earplugs that I would plug into my phone. And um, I love taking, to them, taking them to the gym because when I hear music, I would make me run faster and longer on the treadmill. But the problem was, is that every time I went to get my cord, out of my gym bag, it would take me like 10 minutes to detangle it all. And then even once I got those uh, earplugs in my ears, I would question like, what is wrong with the shape of my ears that they just keep falling out? But, you know, I, I just dealt with it. And, but it wasn't until later when I, <laughs> I came across headphones and I have those, um, oh gosh, those uh, Beats headphones and I just put them on now and the sound comes so clear and so loud. And I thought to myself, you know, I used to think that plug-in earpiece was so cool and so great. And now it's like, I look at it and it's like, put that in the trash because I have, I have the better thing now. And so again, I warned you that was a corny analogy, but what Paul's saying is compared to Jesus Christ in the and the, and the grace and the righteousness found in Christ, everything else that he esteemed, he now thinks is just worthless and trash. And you know, in Paul, he wasn't passive about his relationship with Jesus. He was passionate. And, um, you know, he was such a good teacher. And I loved the analogy that he gave us in chapter three. It was like this this illustration that he paints of he, him being a, an athlete and he's on the racetrack ready to run. And Paul recognized that salvation is the starting point of a believer. That's when, you know, when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's like that's the day you get your sneakers on and you get your jersey and you're on the starting block. But then Paul knew that he needed to start running and the whole, his whole life was going to be running this race. So after salvation comes sanctification. And that's an ongoing work where we're just pursuing Jesus, where we're getting to know him and love him and to be more like him. And that's where Paul is. He's running this race. And he knows that at the end of the race is going to come the prize. And he knows that he's not going to be made perfect. He's not going to have that glorification till he comes to the end of his life and whether God takes him home or whether Jesus comes back and he sees him face to face. So it goes salvation, sanctification, and then glorification. And, you know, Paul is so goal, goal oriented, which I really appreciate about him because I feel like God wired me that way that I really thrive on a goal and, um, and just, and just knowing like how to pace myself. And in Philippians 3.13, Paul says this, 
one thing I do. Now we know Paul did a lot of things, right? He was very effective. But what he's saying now is he has this one focus that overrides everything else in his life. The one thing he does is forgetting those things which are behind, but reaching forward to those things ahead. He said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I can just picture Paul, you know, on that racetrack, running strong, running hard after Jesus. And he's just laser focused on that finish line. And I think he can picture Jesus at that finish line, cheering him on and holding his prize and holding his crown. And I want to be like that too. That's the way I want to run. You know, I was just talking to my kids about purpose and about goals because I think a lot of times and you hear this, people are wondering, well, what is my purpose? And we need to know what our purpose is. And you know what your purpose is? And anyone who's listening to this, there is one purpose, that universal overall call that God puts on all of our lives, that invitation, and that is to know him, to love him, and to become more and more like him. That is your purpose. That's the universal purpose. But then within that purpose, God gives us an individual call where he will use our gifts and our talents and our abilities um, to, be, to, um, to bring him glory and to bring fruit in our lives. And I just wanna end with one more thought. You know, I can look at Paul and I can easily become intimidated, the great apostle Paul. But Paul was so humble and he would be the first to say, you know, I haven't arrived. There's still more for me to learn and to know. And I think that's how it is with people who are so close to Jesus, you know. Um, they see where they are lacking. The closer you get to holiness, the more you realize your own sinfulness. But he had that desire and that um, pursuit for Christ. And so instead of being intimidated by Paul, we need to imitate Paul. You know, Paul is our coach. And he also tells us that we need to find running partners, that we are not in this race alone, that we need to find other women, other people that are on the same course, headed for the same goal. And I just wanna finish with this, um, this verse uh, in the message translation, it's of the end of Philippians. And Paul says, friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward. It's to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal. Okay, girls, you've got your sneakers on. Let's keep running.